<coughs> okay. Uh. Okay, so uh, so this is the title of today's lecture. I started. Uh, started talking about snails versus melons uh, in uh, combinatorics of 5-4 theory uh, last time and uh, gave a little bit of preview. So the goal of today's lecture is to basically try to give you more detail about combinatorics of large n theories. And, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, until a few months ago, we mostly talked about uh, vector versus matrix large n limits, but now there is a kind of uh, new kid on the block, which is these tensor models. So, <coughs> so I want to talk about that, and it can all be phrased in the context of just a 5-4 theory with, with multiple fields, right? So, so th these are the two types of graphs you encounter right away, for example, for the propagator correction. So if you have just a leading propagator, so these are basically all just combinatorics of uh, combinatorics of 5-4 series. And the dimensionality does not matter. I just want to talk about the index structure. So for example, uh, at leading order, you just have the propagator, which will be of order 1. And then at uh, one loop order, you encounter this. People often call it the tadpole diagram, but I think the original meaning of tadpole was reserved for something in phi cube theory, right? With a, uh, like, so so this is one thing that I learned while teaching QFT is the, to call a snail a snail because <laughs> because a tadpole is usually this, right? This is tadpole. Uh, Still, it's many people call this that fall because there is no momentum flowing through. But uh, and these, I uh, people often call them sunset. Also, right? That's the standard name, but the modern terminology is melon. <laughs> 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 so this is sun. Okay, so <coughs> so let's uh, uh, talk about the the three different situations that we can have. So. So the vectorial large n limit, I mentioned it last time, and Juan mentioned it in his lecture. You just take uh, n phi fields, and then uh, you write down the quartic potential with this index structure, so there is O-n symmetry. So it's O-n symmetric, right, where just uh, phi i goes to uh, some matrix, let's call it M i phi j, phi j. So these are, just for simplicity, I'll take all of these real. So, okay, so, so now uh, what's very convenient for these large n theories is to, <coughs> to draw the, uh, the propagators with an index structure, right? So for example, in such a theory, what you will have typically is that the the two-point function of phi i, phi j will just be, say, delta i j times some uh, momentum-dependent factor. But uh, as uh, you'll see, I will mainly talk about d equals zero theories where this is the, <laughs> the exact answer. So the propagator looks like this, right? Just uh, the index propagating like this. And then the index structure of the vertex will be so this is a quartic vertex, so there will be a G sitting here, and they kind of veer off like this. Like uh, one index goes like this, and the other index goes like this. Okay, and then you can start uh, drawing diagrams uh, with this index structure. So for example, uh, the snail diagram is, is going to have this form, right? Where now, uh, so you basically take, say, this propagator, and connect this back to itself. And every closed loop gives you a factor of n, right? Uh, so this contributes a factor like delta jj equal n. That's why this graph will have, compared to the propagator, a factor g times n, 
right? And that gives you an idea that this must be kept fixed in the large end limit, right? So, so basically, you want to take the large end limit, which keeps the snail diagrams in the game, right? That's uh, and another indication for this, which I mentioned uh, last time, was that if you do 4 minus epsilon expansion, you very, very clearly see that this G comes out to be of order 1 over n. So, so this is the standard large end limit. But now what about the melon or the sunset? Uh, then when you draw the structure, right, so, so you see that you, can, you still only make one loop, one index loop, not two index loops. So now there are two factors of G, but still only one index loop, just like for the, uh, for the snail. So this gives G squared N, which in this large N limit uh, is suppressed, right? So melons, therefore, only contribute at order 1 over N. Uh, so melons are suppressed. Uh, but physically, this is actually OK. Because, for example, this just means that the, the, uh, if you really study, for example, the ON model in three dimensions, this is the first diagram that contributes to what? Just to check that you, you've read Peskin and Schroeder. What does this diagram not contribute to? Two? Yeah, yeah, wave function or normalization, right? The Z, the Z factor, right? So this contributes to mass renormalization, but not wave function or normalization. And we know that the anomalous dimensions come from derivatives of the Z factors, right? So, so this is the first one that contributes uh, to wave function or normalization. So this, this uh, basically, the fact that all these diagrams uh, with melons are suppressed tells us that the dimension of phi for example, in this 3D RN model will be uh, one half plus something of order one over n. Uh, and this indeed looks uh, like even for the uh, Ising model, which I mentioned, this, uh, the exact scaling dimension is, uh, is very close to 0.5, just like the video. Okay, so in vector models, there is a, there is a snail, very strong snail dominance, or you can also call it bubble. Often people call these bubbles, and I'll, I'll show this in a second in more detail because I, I will, uh, I've made up some notes which I'll post soon on just computations of zero point functions. So this is so far just a preview to give you the different limits. Now the matrix limit. Uh, matrix large end limit. This is uh, something that uh, both Johanna and Juan already mentioned. I, I will do it just for the sake of uniformity. I'll do it in a slightly different way because uh, uh, Johanna mainly talked about Hermitian matrices uh, where there is UN symmetry group. Uh, and then, uh, so for example, in N equal 4 Suprian Mills, so in n equal for super angles uh, uh, with SUN gauge group, we have these uh, these fields phi A, right, where it goes from 1 to 6, and each of them is in the joint representation. So this is in the joint of SUN. And uh, and this is the case Toft originally considered in his uh, classic paper on large end limit. And here, uh, you basically draw the propagator in this double line notation, because you basically think of each of these fields as like a combination of fundamental and anti-fundamental, right? Which is the adjoint. So here we will have index i flowing like this and index j flowing backwards. But in fact, there are other variants of, of these matrix models. So let me just discuss for fun the case where this, this is just a real general matrix, not symmetric, just a general real matrix. Okay, and the interaction is constructed like this. Uh, it's written as, uh, this is the index structure, phi a1, b1, phi a1, b2, phi a2, b1, phi a2, b2. Uh, 
And uh, notice that this interaction preserves, uh, so it preserves the actually all n cross o n symmetry uh, with the with the first o n acting on uh, the first index and the second o n acting on the second index. So the transformation will be like phi a b goes into say m1 a a prime m2 b b prime phi a prime b prime and uh, if you write if you just if you don't like indices and really like index free notation right then this can be written as just phi uh, remember matrix multiplication right you can uh, so this this just goes like phi to m1 phi m2 transpose right uh, this is this is how and these m1 and m2 are two different on matrices so so the upshot is that you treat these two indices as distinguishable, right? The first index transforms under one ON and the second index transforms under the other ON. By the way, just, just as a minor destruction, in terms of matrix multiplication, how would you write this, this product? Any guesses? Yeah, good, good. Phi Phi transpose, Phi Phi transpose, right? So. So this can be written as just, uh, so you can write V in this matrix language as G over 24 trace phi phi transpose phi phi transpose. And then you can easily check that when you plug in this transformation and use the fact that M1, M1 transpose, etc., is equal to the identity you you clearly see the invariance of this, this interaction. Okay, so now when we start doing the, the similar notation to this, uh, this Hoff double line notation, uh, it's convenient to use these colorful graphs where, where the, the A indices, like the first indices of the, uh, that belong to the first ON, uh, so let me just say that this is the, so you can say that this is the blue ON and this is the red ON. They're just distinguished by different lines. So the vertex is going to look like this, okay? And this is literally true. Like if you follow the line of the vertex, you basically see that this is phi A1, B1, and this is phi A1, B2, because this index follows to here. And then this is phi A2, B2, and this is phi A2, B1. So this is exactly the product that appears. And now, uh, armed with this vertex, and of course the propagator is something really simple, right, in this case. <coughs> so if you want to write down the propagator, in our case, it's just going to be uh, for example, phi A1, B1, phi A2, B2. That's just the only ON invariant thing I can write is delta A1, B1, delta A, sorry, A1, A2, delta B1, B2. And the pictorial way to represent this is just to to draw it like a double line with two separate colors. But the lines are not oriented. They're just distinguished by two different colors, unlike in this case. And this is actually the reason why you can get non-orientable diagrams. But okay, so now let's go back to snails and melons. So, uh, so the snail is going to look like this. So you see that the maximum number of loops you can get, for example, for this one, uh, if you look at locally, cut this off, it looks exactly like this vertex, right? And then I just glue these two sides together, or these, uh, right? And then I get basically this, this uh, structure. So you see that there is an index loop, a blue index loop. So this gives me G times N. So it again tells me that lambda must be fixed. Uh, lambda equals to GN is fixed. Okay, and now what about the melon? 
uh, it gets more interesting. So now you see that this double line separates into three properly colored double lines and the alternation of colors is okay. So you always in this theory will get like alternation of loops of one color then the other color and so on. And you see that there are now two index loops. Okay. Uh, uh, and then you get two factors of n. So you get lambda squared here without any suppression. So, so here basically uh, it's a draw, right? Uh, both snails and melons contribute. No one is winning. And actually all sorts of other stuff contributes as I'll say in a moment. Uh, okay, and one, one other comment is that in principle this theory could even be generalized to, since the indices are, are uh, distinguishable, you could make, say, the first index run from 1 to n1 and the second run from 1 to n2. And then you would just have O n1 cross O n2 symmetry. So that would be like a theory of a rectangular matrix, which is still okay. And then you can play with different ratios, for example. But I won't go into, so that's one of the advantages of this type of structure. Okay, so this is uh, stuff from, I would say that is from the 60s, this is from the 70s. <laughs> so it's pretty well known. But then, uh, like some sometime last fall, I, I really learned something. I've been working on large N series basically my whole research life, essentially. and. And people always talked about what about tensors, what about tensors, but uh, but uh, somehow the feeling is that since uh, the theory obviously gets more complicated as you go from vectors to matrices, the naive guess would be that it's just going to get really hard as you go from from matrices to uh, to tensors. But some brave researchers actually looked carefully and they found that it's not the case. But uh, it's still, it's a little bit more subtle than, than uh, so let me talk about the case of tensors, which is my main mission of these lectures. So, uh, so three is tensors. Actually, before I get to that, here is a trick question for you. Uh, is this the only interaction I can write, which is quartic and consistent with uh, O n cross O n symmetry. Anyone has any ideas what else we could write? Exactly, double trace. So you can, so it's not a unique interaction. Uh, so, so in addition to this, there there is also. So let me just uh, very briefly mention that. So in matrix models, there is a possibility. Uh, so for matrices, can also have uh, also have these so-called double trace interactions. Of course, for higher powers, you can even have, like, if you had phi to the 6, you could have triple trace and so on. But if you limit to phi 4, you can have double trace. So we can write, for example, delta V is equal to G double trace, and then write trace phi phi transpose all squared, right? And this can also be written in, in this index form, uh, in this colored index form, but it looks different. Basically, you will have, let's see, something like this. And then, and then here you would have something like this. Oh. So that's that's the index organization that you would have here. And you see that if this is, say, A1, 
A1 and this is uh, B1, B1. And then this will be A2, A2. And this is B2, B2. So the, then the rule is basically you have phi A1, B1, phi A1, B1, which is just this times the same thing, right? But then you notice that once you look at these same snails and tadpoles and various other diagrams, you you see that uh, that the counting of powers actually changes, right? For example, the snail will will give give me the following thing. Sorry. Yeah, let me just. So you will have something like this. This is what the snail is going to look like, right? So the so now there are two index loops. So so you uh, so you basically will have that that uh, now this will contribute g double trace times n squared. So the the only sensible limit is to keep this fixed. Call this lambda double trace. And now this is fixed in the large n limit. Because if you if you scale this as 1 over n again, this is going to blow up and overwhelm everything. And you don't want that to happen. But it, so basically, that's, that's, uh, it can be done. And this, uh, this actually, uh, so you, you can adopt uh, the situation where you have both that, that interaction and this double trace interaction. And actually then, these, these actually contribute also at leading large n limit. Uh, there is some strange lore that many people have that somehow double traces are non-planar and, and so on. But uh, detailed examination actually shows that, uh, that if you add, so this, uh, so this double trace, double trace uh, terms uh, contribute at leading order. And I'll, ma I'll mention a little bit more. They're even capable capable of changing the so-called universality class. Like, for example, these matrix models. They were very popular in the. Uh, 80s and 90s as models that generate very large random lattices and they were like an approach to uh, random surfaces. They basically give you in a very elegant way a theory of random surfaces. And then in those theories you can add these double trace interactions and they look like wormholes. They basically glue two different surfaces together at the point. This, this is a kind of gluing point for for different surfaces, so it's kind of fun, and uh, and they do uh, contribute in a very interesting way. So this is just to say that even at the level of the matrix, there is some amount of non-uniqueness in the five-four theory that you can have, uh, even with this symmetry imposed. Yeah, well, yeah, like so. If you think of these warm uh, world sheets as two-dimensional quantum gravity then these would be the wormholes in two-dimensional quantum gravity. That, uh, actually, I wrote, uh, there was a very nice paper around 91 by Dust, Har, Wadia, and Sengupta, maybe. Uh, and then they basically studied this double trace theory and showed that it affects the so-called uh, critical exponent for random surfaces. And then I wrote the, some papers on this too, like in different settings. Okay, so so now uh, so now let's move on to tensors. So in the case of tensors, uh, so just for uniformity, let me adopt the by analogy. Just say uh, so it's enough to consider rank three, which already teaches us this whole new way of taking large end limit. And uh, so you take basically phi A, B, C with distinguishable indices. So each index, each index runs um, from one to N. 
And now, by analogy with this, we want to impose ON cross ON cross ON symmetry. We basically want to say that each of these indices rotates on their separate time. Uh, I'm sorry, this question must have come from an experience, but what are, gonna, what are the main physical differences between the single trace and the double trace model? I mean, I know I took you off the diagrams to figure it out, but. Yeah, you. Uh, Well, I think I think we're uh, so ju just jumping a little bit ahead. Like if you just have the single trace model, it it will generate that for us. For example, the leading topology will be just a spherical topology. So you you will, for example, uh, discretize the sphere sphere in terms of uh, in terms of squares that are dual dual lattices to this. So 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 the so if you take this leading large n limit, if you take uh, n to infinity, all that remains is just graphs of spherical topology or, or planar graphs, people call them. And what these uh, double trace traces do is they take another sphere and just build, establish a little uh, wormhole between them. And then you have a composite sphere, which is just a a gluing of these two spheres. So you can grow trees of these spheres, basically. And it turns out what happens as you enhance the weight of this, so the weight for this will be this lambda double trace. It turns out that for small lambda double trace, the composite spheres you get are very similar to the original spheres. But if, if you tune lambda double trace to a certain critical value, then suddenly the structure of the theory changes, and uh, uh, and I'll explain in a in a moment how uh, what this means. But if you tune it even higher, then the theory kind of becomes less interesting. It becomes uh, everything will be dominated essentially like by polymers of bubbles, and uh, and then you do you get what people consider a boring universality class. And I'll explain actually in great detail what the difference between these two universality classes. The, the one that appears here, which you would just say is a polymer universality class, and the one that appears for a single uh, a sphere, which is like the pure two-dimensional quantum gravity. Uh, I, it will become easier to understand when I tell you a little bit more because I'll actually solve this model exactly in the planar limit and, and stuff like that. Yeah, you basically want to count how many surface, uh, how the partition function grows uh, depends. It's basically the growth of the number of graphs with the uh, with a triangulation, uh, with a number of triangles. You're counting graphs. And so the theories for all my endpoint functions will look similar and stuff like that? Well, the details will be different, but the, uh, I'll, I'll get to, you'll see in great detail <laughs> what I mean. Like, for example, so in this model, when you take this lambda, uh, so you can write down the integral. Yeah, maybe I'll just. So, for example, what do we do with this this whole uh, st uh, story? We so, for example, the model for random surfaces. Uh, so, random surface application application. The word app didn't exist back then. <laughs> uh, so. So you write some partition function, which is the integral product d phi a b, uh, product a b, e to the minus v, right? Uh, and v is that that uh, uh, single trace potential, sorry, will be minus phi a b uh, phi a b divided by 2, just to give you the propagator. And then you will have minus uh, g over 24, this trace phi phi transpose, phi phi transpose. 
Okay, so then uh, it turns out that there is a trick to solve this theory exactly in terms of the eigenvalue distribution, which I'll explain. But ju ju jumping a little bit ahead, you basically find that log z uh, divided by, uh, by n squared has the following expansion. It's some f0 of lambda, okay, plus uh, 1 over n uh, plus correction. Let, let me just not be specific, like we'll be. Yeah, in, in Hermitian matrix model, there is only 1 over n squared correction. Here, because the surfaces are not orientable, there is also this uh, RP2. So it's like genus half surface, but let's like not worry about it. But if you just study F0 of lambda, uh, you can actually, this is something that's really amazing and counterintuitive about large end theories, that it can be defined even at negative lambda. So when the potential is unbounded, the, this uh, function still makes sense. So, so large n is like a great stabilizer, okay? That's one of the powers of large n is to stabilize unstable theories. So it turns out that so this uh, can be continued continued uh, to lambda less than zero even. Uh, and that, but eventually you encounter uh, some negative value lambda c, where, which is where a branch cut appears and the, everything becomes complex and not so meaningful. And, and essentially the whole issue about this universality of critical exponent is to say that this F0 of lambda near this lambda C uh, has the structure uh, like lambda minus lambda C to the 5 halves plus regular terms. Okay, and lambda c is negative in this case. So this is, uh, people were extremely excited about this. This is basically what tells you that you're dealing with a theory of, of surface. <laughs> you develop some singularity, and what happens when you uh, dial up this, so the reason negative lambda c is good is because then you're building up the weight for each uh, each vertex becomes positive. Like, uh, yeah, like if you if you're careful, right? This this vertex is really minus g, or <laughs> right? When you expand e to the minus s, you get so this is also minus g here. So that's why negative g is what you want for your theory of random surfaces. But and then as as you dial this minus g to, you increase it. And then there is a point where the surface becomes large, like it consists of many, 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 uh, many squares. And that's where you can take a continuum limit, thinking of each square as very small. And, th and so you define this uh, continuum limit exactly here, near lambda c. And that was uh, what many, many people worked on in 89, 90, 91, and uh, okay. So, so that's what, uh, so the, this critical exponent, it's con conventional to define it as lambda minus lambda c to, to minus gamma. And people call this the susceptibility exponent. So, <laughs> so it turns out that if you play with the double trace interaction and turn it on a little bit, it doesn't change this five paths. But then when you dial it to some critical value, it suddenly jumps to five thirds. <laughs> and then you dial it a bit more and it jumps to three halves. So it affects, so it affects like, this kind of bulk properties of this uh, large surface. <coughs> so did that help or? Can answer my question and give me intuition identity of that. So. Okay, so uh, I'll actually post the notes. Uh, yeah, the beautiful thing is that some of these zero dimensional models can really be solved in great detail. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, the, the, the amazing thing, exactly, the amazing thing about planar graphs is that the series uh, is, is just geometric. So, so there is a finite radius of convergence and it's defined by this lambda c. 
So, okay, so now tensors are really more tricky. Uh, so what can we write? Uh, so each index runs from 1 to n. And we want to impose this on, impose on cube symmetry. So another, and the symmetry acts in a completely analogous way to here, like there will be phi ABC goes to M1 AA prime, M2 BB prime, M3 C prime times phi A prime B prime C prime, and now these are the three uh, 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 three separate uh, and matrices, and now so now you can again have for example the by O n cube symmetry expect the propagator to look like uh, A two B two C two. That's uh, Delta A1, A2, Delta B1, B2, Delta C1, C2. And this we will represent now by a, a triple. So this is what people who work on this for a living call stranded graphs or wire graphs. Or so one, one way is to think, uh, right, so this is, uh, there will be additional middle green index. So you can think about these graphs with an extra middle index inserted of, of a different color. Okay, and now uh, let's draw the, try to draw the stranded. So now the there are actually three types of vertices that you can write consistent with 5-4 interaction and on cube symmetry. One of them will be essentially a double trace thing. Like, uh, so you can still write a uh, double trace is the easiest one in a way, right? You can just write uh, phi ABC, phi ABC all squared. Right, that's really easy. It's obviously invariant, and you can have this uh, G double trace type interaction. But that's not the one that I will want so much. I mean, you can include it, but but the the really interesting one is is the, the following one. It's uh, uh, V is G over 24 phi a1 b1 c1 phi a1, B2, C2, phi A2, B1, C2, phi A2, B2, C1. And we, we call it uh, the tetrahedron vertex because it actually looks like a tetrahedron projected onto a plane. And uh, so here is a special thing about this vertex is that every two tensors every two phi's have exactly one index in common. Like for example, these two have A1 in common. These two have uh, B1 in common. These two have C1 in common and so on. So it's a special property. And if you try to draw it, uh, let's try to draw it. Maybe the easiest is to uh, save time is to adapt this picture here. Uh, let me just uh, so let me just forget about this. And you have to fill in the middle middle lane, uh, middle one, and it's filled in like this. Uh, so so there will be a green, green one here, and then a green one that passes under it. So it's not a planar vertex. You see, like, uh, so the, you take the matrix vertex with these uh, blue and red lines, and then you fill in the middle one so that they cross under each other. 
And then we can see that this is this corresponds to this story because you if you label these vertices, for example, here you'll have A1, B1, C1, and then A1 follows here, so you'll have A1 here, this will be B2, and this will be C2, and then you follow this one here, this will be uh, A2, A2, but you see this is B1 because it passed here. So this is B1, and then this one is C2. You see, because this is the C2 follows here, and then this one is uh, A2, right? A2, B2, um, C1. And then if you compare with that picture, you see phi A1, B1, C1, phi A1, B2, C2, phi A2, B1, C2, phi A2, B2, C1. So it's exactly the picture corresponding to this index contraction. Okay, so what is uh, special about this vertex? You see that at every interaction, some middle lines have to cross under each other, okay? So for example, let's now look at, so let's forget about matrices, and now we're doing tensors. So what is the snail going to look like? You start with this green, you, sorry, where is my so the green goes like this. And then it, here it passes under the itself, passes under itself and comes out here. And you see that if you cut this open, it's exactly this vertex. So this is like this vertex tied into points like this. Hmm? Green. Oh. It, green, it looks green here, I don't know. <laughs> Does it look different from red and blue? That's the main thing. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So, so you see that the middle one has to cross under itself. And now let's count the number of uh, vert uh, the number of uh, loops, right? You see that the green one did not contribute any loops, right? It's still only one loop. This blue loop here. So, so now this graph, therefore, has, uh, still has weight Gn, just like in the matrix case. So this still has Gn. And now the crucial thing is to look at this graph, okay? And you, you have to draw the, the, uh, these uh, colored strands so that at each of these vertices, one passes under the other. And what happens, it's done like this. So this middle one has this just closed loop. So this one has a closed loop, right? And this, pass, and this one goes straight through underneath it twice. And this satisfies the rule here, because at each one, there is this crossing, uh, under crossing of the middle line. But now you see that this middle loop here actually contributed an extra index loop. So here you win compared to the matrix because now this becomes G squared and Q. Right, this is G squared and Q. So this, and this is the melon, right? So let's try to scale things so that the, uh, so that this is fixed, right? Right. In other words, you you say that G is equal to lambda divided by n to the three halves power. Right. And then you see that the snail gets suppressed. Right. So in this limit, G n is just lambda divided by square root of n. So you see that what happens is basically. Uh, it really is like uh, the competition of snails and melons. That's the best way I know how to phrase it. 
for vectors, snails clearly win. And that's part of the reason why the theory is so simple. Then, uh, then for, uh, for matrices, both snails and melons contribute equally. And that's why the theory is more complicated. But then, somewhat unexpectedly, there is a limit. There is a choice of tensor theory where the theory becomes simple again because now melons are winning. And, and in fact, you can show that not just these graphs, but pretty much all other graphs go out the window. And that's the really unexpected and, and striking thing. That, so it's not only that snails lost, everyone else pretty much, every non-melon lost. So, so only melons remain. Uh, only melons remain. And just roughly, what is, what, what is a melon? It's, what is this melonic theory? It basically, you have to keep in iterating insertion in a propagator like that. So every time you see a propagator, you can insert this. Okay? Uh, and you just iterate this. Then th at the next stage, you can insert this. At the next stage, you can insert this, and, and so on. So, uh, so there will be melons inside melons inside melons. But, but this theory is, again, exactly solvable. That's, uh, so, so it is still solvable. One thing about this matrix theory is that while it is solvable in in the case of one matrix model, it stops being solvable even when you take like uh, more than one, like uh, take matrices in more than one dimension. You know, if we could solve all matrix series, we would long be done with Young-Mills theory, right? Because Young-Mills is like a matrix series. So under very special circumstances, it's solvable, but generally it's not. But these vector and melon theories seem to be always solvable. And that's sort of an interesting thing. So that was supposed to be the five minute introduction or uh, yeah. Yes. So so this is a, a very theory dependent case, right? For example, uh, this is true only for a pi four theory. If we were considering a pi six theory, we could have like triple trace operators and yeah, it turns out that there is a similar phenomenon for, uh, so to take a uh, phi six theory, you need to take a higher rank tensor. You have to take a tensor with five indices. Uh, then you can couple them in an appropriate way that melons will So uh, if we took like this phi phi transpose whole cube, that wouldn't that be like a different phase? Uh, so, uh, sorry. Uh, like, like we took for... Uh, yeah, yeah, there would be triple tracers, uh, all sorts of other stuff that you can like write. This yeah, one thing that is definitely true is that this statement about melon dominance is a specific property of this choice we made here. Okay, I, I did not include these double traces. And there is one other thing I did not include, which maybe I should mention in the interest of full disclosure, <laughs> but, uh, that there is another. So here, there is another in, uh, potential, which we call pillow potential, the pillow, uh, which looks like G pillow. And then you basically have uh, uh, like phi, phi A1, B1. C1, phi A1, B1, C2, say phi A2, B2, C1, phi A2, B2, C2. So now you see that these two fields actually have a pair of indices contracted. And, and these also have a pair of indices contracted. So, so from the point of view of of these colored graphs, it would actually, this interaction looks completely planar. It looks sort of like this. If I draw it. And now, it, when you add these green lines, they no longer cross under each other in this pillow thing. Uh, so, 
So you draw one like this and the other one like this. So if you add this pillar interaction, you immediately notice that it would not be true for this interaction that that melons dominate over snails. For example, the, what you find is that uh, the snail gets enhanced. Like, uh, let's see. Yeah, you would uh, you would get an in. Let me draw this. So the snail will start looking like this. Uh, first, let me. Then this will be here, and then there is yet another green line that that looks at me. Uh, well, this. Yeah, so you see that there is now a double loop. So, so here you would get the the weighting is that there would be g g pillow times n squared. Okay. Well, there we had n, but here it's okay to wrap the same thing twice. So this will be our lambda pillow. So the the bottom line is that. This pillow is a little bit like double trace in the matrix model. It has to be weighted differently with n for the theory to continue making sense. So you can, uh, you basically have to take uh, g pillow. You want to scale it as one over n squared, not one over n to the three halves. If you if you made a mistake and scaled it as one over n to the three halves, the theory would blow up in your face, and it wouldn't make sense. Uh, so actually, it's okay to have both again, provided you scale them in the same way. And uh, the experts in the study the theories with all of the above. And if you if you want to include the double trace here, just to give you the answer, that needs to be scaled as uh, as lambda double trace over n cube. So you can have a theory with all of this stuff in there, with uh, provided you judiciously scale all these things, and it actually retains a lot of the melonic feature, melonic dominance features. But I think the simplest one is where you just take this uh, this tetrahedral vertex. Yeah, the the erase it. But the one that with these crossed lines. Oh yeah, no, sorry, it's here. So the reason it's a tetrahedron is uh, if you draw a tetrahedron and look at it from above, just straighten these lines. These lines make them like this. So that topologically, if you tie these, so if these are tied to points, this is just a tetrahedron view from above, right? Uh, you all see this? Like, yeah. The the reason these uh, these lines cross under each other is because the tetrahedron is not a planar thing, right? You look at it from above and you see the the two sides crossing under each other. So in, in some sense, it's this magic of this tetrahedron interaction that uh, that gives you a whole new type of universality class for for large n limit. Okay, so now I just want to, uh, in the next lecture I'll actually show, uh, I'll prepare some, s I do have some slides, so it will help to also see this again, maybe a bit faster, but with better quality uh, figures. <laughs> okay, there was a question. Yeah. Absolutely. That was essentially the original motivation. So when people worked on random surface theory from matrices, they wanted to consider random three geometries obtained by gluing these tetrahedra. And they basically, that was the original motivation. Uh, 
There, yes, they did. Actually, in this theory, I will fully exhibit this solution. It was obtained in 2011 by Bonzom, Gorao, Riello, and Rivasto. Uh, there is a very simple solution uh, for, for this type of theory. The, the reason people bogged, got bogged down in er, originally with these tetrahe stacking tetrahedra is because they were looking at just, for example, the case of ON with a symmetric three tensor. And that turns out to be a really tricky thing that still no one knows how to prove melanic dominance in. Uh, but uh, Tarnopolsky and I did a direct analysis up to G to the 8. We actually posted a paper like uh, 10 days ago. And we still find melanic dominance in that theory as well, although we don't have a proof. But, but in this theory with three colors, the, the theory with ON cube symmetry, it's essentially like a tool, a very short proof, and people were missing it. Then, around 2011-12, Gorao and Rivasopra basically found this proof. The, in a nutshell, the proof is like this: you draw these triple line, tri triply colored uh, graphs, then you erase one color. Erase one color, then you are left with just a double line graph. But we know all about double line graphs. We know how to count them. We have that was done by Toft essentially. <laughs> so using that, using this ability to erase one color at a time, it just pops out that that in this uh, that there are no diagrams that blow up in this limit. And uh, I, I will mention it in the next lecture. So so the trick it seems like a minor technicality. Just you have to take, for example, this phi ABC with three distinguishable indices. And then you can prove the, that only melon diagrams dominate. In the other case, they still seem to dominate, but just somehow proof has not been found yet. But it still seems to work. So. But indeed, the original motivation was this uh, three geometry, three-dimensional quantum gravity. And uh, I'll explain why it was a bit uh, uh, frustrating that it it basically doesn't give you a nice bulked up geometries. It gives you these fingered phases, like polymer-like phases. OK, so, so, but I'm glad I went in detail over this just to give motivation. But now I have these notes that, uh, so I want to now, uh, here are some elements already, but I want to just carefully go over the calculation and D equals zero. So let's just uh, focus on the just the partition function in uh, a pure. Your zero-dimensional case, N namely, you're just dealing with an integral. So, so d equals zero phi four theory. So first, let's just consider n equal one, namely just one field, no symmetry. Then, so z of g is just an integral, right? It's integral from minus infinity to plus infinity d phi over root 2 pi e to the minus minus g over 24 pi to the 4, right? So this is a great toy model for Feynman uh, diagrams, right? Like if you uh, want to get practice just computing of course, you don't need to do integrals here, but there are still symmetry factors, right? So what are the leading diagrams? So you can just start expanding this, right? You just start expanding this as, uh, uh, as 1, 1 minus g over 24 pi to the 4, right, plus g over 24 squared over 2, phi to the 8, and so on, right? 
And uh, so what's the first uh, diagram coming from here? That's going to be like a snail type diagram, which, uh, which is just figure eight, right? So the rule is basically that the propagator is, uh, is one, right? This is just one. And the vertex uh, is minus g, right? The vertex is minus g. And then you start building up diagrams, but there are symmetry factors. Do you know what the symmetry factor for this is? Uh, hmm? One eight, right? Because there is this one, this one, and then there is this symmetry. And uh, but if you if you have any doubts, you can just do this integral, right? Pi to the four. You know how to do this? Uh, how to do any integral with Gaussian insertion just by differentiating with respect to this thing. And indeed, you find that that uh, this is equal to. 1 minus g over 8. And then the next thing will be 35 g squared over 384. And then minus 3 385 g cubed divided by 3072. And so on. So you just get these fun numbers. And this one is the unique diagram. It's really this one. And this one, uh, which two diagrams does it come from? The so the first one will be just the melon, basically. And the second one will be triple bubble, you can call it. OK. so. So and then you can try to compute the symmetry factors from these diagrams and, and see that they correctly add up to this. Uh, so, so this one has symmetry factor 1 over 2 times 4 factorial, because there is this 4 factorial and still the twofold symmetry here. And this one gives 1 over 2 to the 4, because each one gives one half, and then this, so this gives one over two to the four, and, and this correctly actually reproduces this this thing. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah. This of course gives you the expansion of log z, right? So so far I wrote down the z, but if I write down log z, so so what we want to focus on is log z of g. And this gives us minus g over 8 plus g squared over 48 uh, from here plus g squared over 16 from here. So this is the sum of these two diagrams. And this gives us minus g over 8 plus g squared over 12 plus so on. But then, yeah, th then you can just take the log of this and obtain whatever you want to some pretty high order. So the next one will be like minus 11 g cubed over 96, and so on. Uh, but there, there is good news that in this theory, you actually, this integral is just doable in terms of decimal form. Right, so, <laughs> so this, uh, so the exact answer for this integral is, so the z of g can just be written down in closed form, and it's, so the z of g is, square root of 3 over 2 pi g, uh, e to the 3 over 4 g, k 1 quarter of 3 over 4 g. And this turns out to be the asymptotic expansion of the Bessel function uh, at 
Yeah, so when G becomes small, this is this this is K of very large argument. And there are some formula for for doing asymptotic expansion and so on. And and this series is badly, badly divergent, right? I mean the coefficients blow up very rapidly. And this is just a fact of life about any perturbative series in field theory that basically the the coefficients uh, coefficient of g to the n blows up like n factorial. But at least in this case, it's obviously that the series is summable. Like there are, if you do Borel summation where you divide by n factorial first, you can do it. And I mean, there is a function, right? There is a, you can plot this function. Uh, you can look at the, how the, the log of this function behaves. What happens is if you crank up G, for example, at large value of G, uh, what do you expect to happen? That the, this E to the minus G phi to the four term will just start cutting it off more and more. You can just do some trivial rescaling to see that, that this behaves like G to the minus uh, one quarter for as G goes to infinity. So it's a perfectly well-defined integral. You can compute it numerically. So even though this, uh, this coefficients here are going to get huge really fast, and it's, it's a good practice to see they get out of control really fast, but for small g, the actual value of... Uh, so asymptotic series are not useless, right? They still give you very good numerical approximation for small values of g if you include a couple of low order terms and I checked it. So, okay, so sorry to bore you with this stuff, but it's still, it's kind of fun to see this toy model for field theory. And now I want to proceed to multi-field example. So what I did here are just all different kinds of multi-field generalizations of this. So, so let's just consider the following general class of multi-dimensional integrals. Uh, where you will just say so multi field will be Z is uh, let's just say there are n fields phi i i runs from one to n and mind you this is little n this is not big n sometimes it will be the same as big n but sometimes it will be like big n squared or big n cubed. Or Okay, so this is like product uh, uh, 1 to n integral d phi i minus infinity to plus infinity over root 2 pi e to the minus 1 half phi i phi i and then minus 1 over 24 sub c i j k l phi i phi j Right. So, so now, obviously, this is already like if you have a million fields, you're not going to be uh, just grinding it out numerically on a computer. But that's where the power of large n comes in, that there are ways to evaluate it analytically. So all that we're acquiring so far is that CIJKL is some symmetric tensor. Symmetric tensor. Nothing to do with those tensors. Soon we will make these phi i's into tensors, right? Like if you replace this little i by a triple index like a, b, c, this is... So, so our tensor model, our matrix model, our vector model are all in this class with just different choices of symmetries and so on. Okay, but you can just still look at the Feynman graphs, and again, you can say that this phi i phi j is delta i j, so this will be our propagator, right? And the vertex will be the vertex will be like minus c i j k l, right? I j k l. That's what the vertex will look like. And then again, 
So then the, di the Feynman diagrams will look very similar, right? You just apply the Feynman rules and, uh, and you get the following expansion for log z. So now, so this graph, you see that there will be pairs of indices connected. So, so this graph will give me minus c i i j j divided by eight. This graph will give me c i j k l c i j k l divided by forty eight. This will be this one, and the triple bubble will be c i i k l. You see why? Because two indices of this vertex got contracted together. That's why I have CIIKL and then CKLJJ, right, divided by 16. So, so the log Z can be just written out in this form, right? Uh, so these are the three terms in log z that, that we can have, right? And then you can, if you're very strong, you can keep at it just writing down diagrams with symmetry factors and or maybe write a computer program that, that does it. <laughs> uh, okay, so now let me uh, then, so this, clearly this example encompasses the, the three cases I've discussed so far, right? Uh, basically, all five four theories are contained in here. So let me just show how you work the vector, how n model in zero dimensions. So let's just uh, let me go over the log z in these. Uh, I have to stop soon, right? Uh, yeah. Two, two minutes. Yeah, I just want to give a flavor of this ON model. So ON model, uh, so Z vector, Z vector of G, what we want is basically product from 1 to N, D phi I over root 2 pi, right, uh, E minus phi, I phi I, over 2 minus g over 24 phi i phi i uh, phi j phi j. This is just a special case of that general class of models where we take little n equal to big N, right? And we take c i j k l equal to G over three delta i j k delta k l plus two permutations to symmetrize it like delta i k delta j l plus delta i l delta j k. Okay, so so that's our our n model, and then we can take this general formula for log z that I already wrote out here in terms of these c's. Just plug it in, and we get the following perturbative expansion for log z vector. You just get that, you find that log z vector of g divided by n has the following structure. It's minus n plus 2 over 24g plus, this comes from figure 8. Then there is plus g squared and plus 2 over 144 plus g squared and plus 2 squared and plus 2 squared over 144 plus order g cube. So this comes from the melon, this is melon, and this comes from the bubble. Right, and this is figure eight. And then you immediately see that the melon loses out, right? Like we already showed before. Before I just drew some kind of index loops for you. 
This is, there is no controversy about this. This is just Feynman graphs <laughs> ground out with all the subleading factors. You see that in the large end limit, this goes like g squared n, n while the bubble goes like g squared n squared. So, so then there is absolutely no argument that you have to take the limit where gn, uh, where gn is equal to lambda. And then this term does not survive. And you get, uh, basically, you can write this as, uh, yeah, this will be the last equation. So log, log z vector over n. We'll have the structure of f0 of lambda plus 1 over n f1 of lambda plus our orders. And we can read off, for example, f0 of lambda from these two terms. We see that f0 of lambda is minus lambda over 24 plus lambda squared over 144 plus order lambda cube. So one thing that we, we will discover is that here the coefficients don't grow as factorial. And luckily, you can actually determine this function exactly, which I'll do at the beginning of next lecture. Uh, so there is a great simplification that you find in this large n limit, and that this function is exactly solvable uh, and uh, has various nice properties. And also it shows something like this, but with a 3 halves critical exponent. So, so I think I should stop here. Thank you. Questions? Uh, yes. Is there a generalized mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. If you if you take, for example, instead of uh, rank three, like rank five, then you have to write uh, a five to the six interaction. No, no. It's rather special. Like, yeah, five to the four loves rank three. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, otherwise it gets so it's a bit more special already on that level. But luckily, rank three is just an example of five four theory. There is one other thing that I wanted to mention, just to in the interest of full disclosure, that this if you actually look at this tetrahedron vertex, uh, it's not positive definite if you actually write it out in terms of the different species of fields. I mean, it's positive definite for n equal 1. <laughs> but once you go to n equal th uh, 2, even already, or 3, it's, it's not a positive function. So the integral, strictly speaking, will not make sense. But as, as I mentioned, the large n is the great stabilizer. Well, first of all, the full integral will not make sense. The perturbative expansion always makes sense, right? Uh, I showed why it makes sense. It's just you see tensors contracted together. So, so perturbatively, you don't care if the, f the integral diverges or not at large values of phi. Another thing I wanted to mention is when you work this out, you see that, for example, the for n equal 1, this vector model just reduces to my one field 5, 4 theory. And all these coefficients have to reduce to the same coefficient that we got from this Bessel function. So that's a kind of good check that you're doing things correctly, including all the subleading terms and so on. This Jordan? I think there people have some more compact notation. I, uh, actually, when we wrote the paper on this and we wrote out the indices, a lot of compliments we got from people is like, thanks for writing out the indices. <laughs> now, now we know what you meant. <laughs> but yeah, in, in papers, you find different versions, I think, maybe. But it's not something as simple as just uh, Wi-Fi transpose. So, yes. 
said it is why uh, a diagram with three vertices cannot be a building block. Um, let's rebuild the three vertices. At least I, I, I'm not, I'm not, I would like that you suppress both, uh, yeah. you suppress all of these, figure eight, and may, maybe it's possible. I, at least I, I mean, people have been looking at combinatorics of five four theory for many, many years. That, that's why it's sort of surprising that, that this new limit was found, because, because I will exhibit like, you can exhibit all graphs up to a certain order, and it's a huge number of graphs, like huge. And suddenly this limit picks out just one here, one here, one here. <laughs> uh, I mean, at, at cubic order, you find some funny things, right, already, like you find, uh, I can even draw which, all the typical ones will be, sorry. Like this one, that's one of the new ones, and, and various other bubble things, and insertions of snails into. Yeah, then the really famous one is this, of course. It's, uh, yeah, we we find actually like when you look at the Melanic limit, you find that. All graphs with triple vertices are automatically suppressed. They cannot contribute, so only even ones contribute. It could be that there is something more fancy, but the fact that it hasn't been found yet doesn't. <laughs> yeah. So, is there an analog that's always just like two tensors? Oh, tensors? No, there, but there is another similar trick. And uh, it's basically a Schwinger-Dyson equation. Actually, Juan wrote down essentially the Schwinger-Dyson equation. That, and the Schwinger-Dyson equation, once you, it's actually quite amazing. Once you ri write it down, and if you have all the coefficients right, you, you really see how it perturbatively matches everything. So there is no possibility of a mistake. Or, but I, I, my goal for the last lecture is basically to show how to solve this Melanic theory. But first I'll solve this one using this uh, hubbard Stratonovich field in, in detail and reproduce these coefficients and, and then the matrix one and then the, the tensor one. Uh, yes, well, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there any connection between this tensor model you're considering to Amazon? Yeah, 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 that's absolutely, that's actually why, so Witten wrote the paper, I mean, this Mellon dominance was observed by uh, Gural and Rivasson collaborators since so 9, 10, but it seemed like a quite separate field with motivation more from these uh, stacking tetrahedra, sort of, and then Witten observed that that uh, th these Mellon diagrams are the same as, as appear in the SYK model, and it's sort of another way to do a SYK model. Like it's a, it's a, in the leading large end limit, they agree exactly, but you don't need any disorder. That's the really nice, uh, to me it's a nice thing. I, I'm not used to disordered sums and here you don't need any disordered sums. Somehow the melon dominance just pops out like straight from index counting. And uh, so it's truly just a large end limit of regular quantum mechanics of some and cube fermions, and I mean that's basically what. Uh, so Witten had a somewhat more complicated model, but Tarnapolsky and I wrote down just a model with n cube fermion fermionic tensors, and in the leading limit, it's just like S Y K. But um, maybe we should take our break. Yeah, yeah, we, so we might. If there's more questions, we can but we yeah, we'll done. also like have the the discussion tomorrow, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, I forget. No, no, sorry, sorry. Yeah, on Thursday there will, will be discussion, so so we can have more. Also, after you hear my lecture tomorrow, you probably will. Then I'll finish, and then you can ask me questions. Thank you. Thank you.
Then I'll go uh, rank four then, sir. Uh, rank four is what fine. Yeah, then you have five to the fifth. Yeah, yeah, always like for so rank how, how R. Many different interactions can we have? Oh, we like have like these still? Uh, I think there are many. Like it grows. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's some this one. Maybe just a double copy of uh, uh matrix, mm -hmm. right? There's some this one. Yeah, I one just has to write it down. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the you definitely in. The nice thing about 5-4 theory is that everyone knows what it is. Like if you write li like 5-5 five, five to the 5th theory with some rank 4, mm -hmm. just... But definitely, they usually people in this field, they are very good in combinatorics, so they do all, all 